All right, good afternoon. My name is Cheryl O'Connor. I'm Vice Chair of the Connecticut Technology Council's Executive Board. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our CT Tech Talk today entitled, How AI Will Impact Our Lives Over the Next 20 Years. Uh, before we get started, just some general housekeeping reminders. Attendees will be on mute during the presentation but we encourage you to submit questions and comments via the Q&A feature during the presentation, which time permitting will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Also, this presentation will be recorded and available on the Connecticut Technology Council's website, www.ct.org, along with recordings of our other tech talks and other CT tech events. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Steve Schwartz. Steve began his career in AI as a postdoctoral researcher in the Yale University Computer Science Department. After leaving Yale in the early 1980s, Steve became a successful entrepreneur launching a number of award-winning companies. And Steve also invests in early stage AI companies, one of which was Tango, which was the sixth best IPO of 2011. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Cheryl. Now, how do I get control of the slides? Ah, there we go. Okay, thanks everyone for joining me today. So how many of you are worried about the scenario on this slide? The possibility of AI taking over the world if we're not careful. I won't ask you to raise your hands because we're on Zoom. And how many of you are worried about AI taking all our jobs? And last, how many of you are still looking at the slide and wondering where the guy's eyes are? Now, in today's presentation, I'm gonna talk about some real issues that we're facing with AI and why we shouldn't be worried about AI taking over the world or taking all of our jobs. AI is powering advances in medicine, weather prediction, factory automation, self-driving cars, and even golf club manufacturing. We use personal assistants like Siri and Alexa daily to help us complete simple tasks. Face recognition apps automatically label our photos and Google Translate helps us understand foreign language web pages and talk to Uber drivers in foreign countries. AI systems perform many tasks that seem to require intelligence. And many of us wonder where it will lead. Science fiction writers have pondered this question Hang on one second. Oh, I guess we'll leave it minimized. There we go. Science fiction writers have pondered this question for, for decades. Some have invented a future in which we have at our service beneficial robots like C-3PO from Star Wars. And for those of you old enough to remember, Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons. Other writers foresee evil AI systems that will develop free will and turn against us like Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator with one mission, eradicate humanity. In fact, many technologists have predicted that AI will take over the world. Tesla founder Elon Musk says that AI is, quote unquote, humanity's biggest existential threat and that it poses a fundamental risk to the existence of civilization. The late renowned physicist Stephen Hawking said, it could spell the end of the human race. The good news is that they are wrong. We don't have to worry about intelligent robots, good or evil. None of you will ever meet an intelligent robot. 
your children won't, and their children won't. I'm going to explain at a high level today how today's amazing AI systems work and why they will never evolve into C3PO or the Terminator. Then I'll talk about social issues caused by AI that you should be worried about and what we can do about them. Most AI systems use a technique called supervised learning. Examples include facial recognition, machine translation, and speech recognition. The way supervised learning works is illustrated in this slide. Suppose you want to build an AI system to diagnose a particular disease. You would create a table of data in which each row represents one person with a known medical history. Half the people have the disease and half don't. The output column represents indicates whether the person has the disease or not. The input columns contain features like age, whether or not the person is a smoker, and other features. The table of data is fed into a supervised learning system that learns a function that can predict whether the person has the disease. Once the computer learns to accurately predict whether the people in the training table have the disease, the function can be applied to people who aren't in the training table. The key point to remember is that a function is learned that can be applied to a specific task like diagnosing a specific disease or labeling faces and images. We all learn functions in school like A plus B equals C. Supervised learning functions are more complex, but they're just mathematical functions. Supervised learning functions can do some amazing things like recognize faces and translate languages. However, each supervised learning function can perform only one narrowly defined task. A system that learns to name the people in photographs can't do anything else. It can't distinguish between a dog and an elephant. It can't answer questions, retrieve information, or have conversations. Moreover, these systems have little or no common sense knowledge of the world and therefore can't reason based on that knowledge. A facial recognition system can identify people's names but knows nothing about those particular people or about people in general. It doesn't know that people use eyes to see and ears to hear. It doesn't know that people eat food, sleep at night, and work at jobs and it can't commit crimes or fall in love. Although these learned functions can perform individual tasks that seem to require intelligence, there is no human level intelligence and there is no way for supervised learning technology to progress to human level intelligence, even when computers become a billion times more powerful than they are today. What about computers that can have a conversation with us? Isn't there intelligence in Siri or Alexa? I remember visiting a zoo and walking by a parrot who made a disagreeable comment about my appearance. Now it was a fair comment. I just didn't like it. I was about to get mad when I realized the parrot had no idea what it was saying and it was just repeating something it heard. Believe it or not, Syria and Alexa don't understand either. <clears throat> In fact, Syria has a much older sister who liked to collect people's deepest secrets. Eliza was created in an MIT lab in 1966 by scientist Joseph Weizenbaum. Professor Weizenbaum would put a person in one room in front of a teletype to communicate with Eliza. Weizenbaum was shocked to discover not only that people thought there was a human therapist on the other side, but they would tell Eliza their deepest, darkest secrets. 
One of the screen is a real conversation from 1966 between a person and Eliza. For example, the person typed, men are all alike, and Eliza responded, in what way? The person said, the patient said, they're always bugging us about something or other. And Eliza responded, can you think of a specific example? And the conversation continues much the same way that a Rogerian therapist might have a conversation. Now, Eliza didn't know anything about families. It just knew how to map keyword pat patterns to responses. It was a simple program with a clever set of rules. The program operated on keywords, phrases, and patterns. For example, Eliza mapped keywords related to family, like mommy and father, to a response like, tell me more about your father. A pattern like this one, everybody something me, would catch a person's statement like everybody is always laughing at me and respond with, who laughed at you recently? Weisenbaum tried to tell his users that Eliza did not understand what they were saying any more than a parrot would. Yet, some users still asked for private time with the system because they felt it understood them. 10 years later, he wrote a book about his experiences with Eliza and his dismay at the high percentage of users who, inside these conversations, would reveal their darkest secrets. Interestingly, Siri and Alexa rely on patterns that are quite similar to those used 50 years ago in Eliza. The biggest difference is that Apple and Amazon have massive teams of developers to create these patterns. And especially in the case of Alexa, they've opened up the ability to create patterns to external developers. However, all of these systems are just simple input-output patterns. When you ask Siri if she'll marry you, she has several programmed responses, such as, you're not the only one who's asked, uh, not that I've asked her. The point here is that there's absolutely no human level intelligence behind Siri or Alexa, and they can't evolve into human level intelligence. So we don't have to worry about human level or su superhuman level AI robots exterminating us or turning us into pets. Today's AI researchers have no concrete idea of how to build systems with real intelligence. As a result, AI systems like C-3PO and the Terminator are about as likely as time travel, teleportation, and reversing aging. But there are many AI issues we should be concerned about. Will AI take our jobs? Will self-driving cars cause accidents? Will AI reduce privacy? Will it increase discrimination? One fear of AI that might even trump fears about killer robots is the fear that AI will take all our jobs. If robots with human level AI were, crea were ever created, they'd be able to read manuals take classes, and learn to do almost every job. Worse, they could read thousands of books in the time it takes a person to read one. If this happened, nearly every job would be at risk. Fortunately, AI systems can't read books because we don't know how to build AI systems that can really understand language. Although the fear of robots with human level intelligence is groundless, and we don't have to worry about intelligent robots threatening every job, some jobs are vulnerable to advances in AI. Jobs that involve monitoring camera feeds can be replaced with AI-based facial recognition and object recognition systems such as gun recognition systems. Down the road, self-driving taxis might take jobs from taxi drivers, but this is already happening with non-AI software from Uber and Lyft. In fact, AI software will take far fewer jobs than conventional non-AI software. And keep in mind, non-AI software has been taking jobs for over 50 years in areas like e-commerce, word processing, 
in many other decades, in many other areas, it's been doing this for decades without causing widespread unemployment because it's been producing jobs also. I don't want to minimize the human impact of job loss. The loss of a job can be a devastating life experience. And as a society, we need to find a way to retrain people who've lost jobs to technology. However, AI will not be anywhere near as disruptive to jobs as conventional computer software. When people ask me about my biggest AI fear, I always answer self-driving cars. Many people assume that self-driving cars will be safer than human drivers. After all, computers can make light and fast decisions and they don't get drunk or tired. All true. But people can do one thing that computers can't. People can think and reason. I have an intellectually disabled daughter. We never thought Carly would be capable of driving when she was eight. We never thought Carly would be capable of driving, but when she was 18, she announced that she was bound and determined to learn how to drive. My idea was that she had to go to a regular driving school with no special supports. She worked really hard and did pretty well. Then I took her for her first drive on a highway. I explained to her how to merge in. And of course, the worst possible scenario ensued. A huge truck roared up in the lane, preventing her from merging. And an idiot behind decides she's merging too slowly and starts passing her on the right. My heart was in my throat. I had no idea what to tell her to do. Somehow she used her common sense and avoided an accident. She might, Carly might not have a high IQ, but she still has common sense reasoning skills. No one knows how to program common sense reasoning into computers. Most of us have encountered unexpected phenomena while driving. A deer darts onto the highway, a flood makes the road difficult or impossible to navigate, drivers are fishtailing while they're trying to get up an icy hill. People don't learn how to handle these edge cases in driving school. We use our common sense to, to predict actions and outcomes. If we hear an ice cream truck in a neighborhood, we know to look out for children running towards the truck. We change our, our driving behavior when we see the car in front of us swerving, knowing that the driver might be intoxicated or texting. Because no one knows how to build common sense reasoning capabilities into AI systems, self-driving vehicle manufacturers must anticipate and code every possible situation. Machine learning can only help to the extent that manufacturers anticipate every situation and provide training examples of every situation. Worse, there are millions, maybe billions of these edge cases. Everyone has at least one crazy driving story and there are 1.4 billion drivers in the world. If there are 1.4 billion of these edge cases, how can they possibly all be identified much less coded? What happens when a self-driving vehicle encounters one of these situations for which it hasn't been explicitly programmed or trained? The worst case, of course, is, is an accident, but it doesn't have to be an accident to be a bad situation. In early 2020, Moscow hosted a driverless vehicle competition. Shortly after it began, a vehicle stalled out of the traffic light. Human drivers would reason about this edge case and decide to just go around the stalled car. However, none of the driverless cars did that and a three hour traffic jam ensued. We don't want autonomous vehicles to crash, but we also don't want them to stop and block traffic every time they encounter an unanticipated situation. It will be difficult, if not impossible, for manufacturers to anticipate every edge case that self-driving consumer, consumer vehicles, <clears throat> excuse me, that self-driving consumer vehicles that can drive anywhere will encounter. As a result, while I do expect to see small numbers of driverless vehicles on the road, I don't expect to see our roads dominated by driverless vehicles for a very long time, if ever. That doesn't mean we won't see any driverless vehicles. We're already starting to see slow moving shuttles on corporate campuses. 
why? It's much easier to predict edge cases for a slow moving vehicle that just travels between point A and point B and point B. Many manufacturers are testing driverless cars and other autonomous vehicles uh, on our roads. But most of these tests are occurring with a safety operator behind the wheel who's responsible for taking over the steering, braking, and acceleration whenever they detect an unsafe situation. The problem is that governments all over the world are rushing this technology to market. In the US, many states are allowing these cars on the road with no testing. The National Highway and Transportation Safety Authority just put out a, a working paper last month that said they don't think it's necessary to set safety standards for self-driving capabilities. My view is that legislatures, legislators should develop safety standards for autonomous vehicles before allowing them on the road without safety drivers. There's even been proposed legislation to remove liability from manufacturers. To me, that would be a disaster. Manufacturers need to be held responsible for their autonomous vehicles, or they won't have an incentive to wait until they're safe. Privacy is another big issue for AI. A few years ago, an angry father charged into a Target store outside of Minneapolis and complained to a manager, my daughter got this in the mail. She's still in high school and you're sending her coupons for baby, clo baby clothes and cribs. Are you trying to encourage her to get pregnant? The manager apologized and then called a few days later to apologize again. On the phone though, the father apologized. He said, I had a talk with my daughter. It turns out there's been some activities in my house I haven't been completely aware of. She's due in August. I owe you an apology. How did this happen? Using AI analytics, a target analyst discovered that it was possible to predict which female customers were pregnant based on their recent purchases. An even more sinister invasion of privacy is being made, is made possible by today's computer vision technology, like the facial recognition technology we talked about earlier. Remember George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984? In that novel, citizens were monitored 24 seven by the government using an AI system named Big Brother. Well, Big Brother is happening today in China. The Chinese government's Sharp Eyes project is connecting security cameras across China to facial recognition software in an effort to monitor all 1.4 billion people in the country and to identify and monitor dissidents and criminals. It's even been used to catch toilet paper thieves. By the end of this year, the 20 largest US international airports will use facial recognition technology to detect terrorists. In the US FBI has images of 640 million adults, many of them called from uh, state driving records. While technology can be tempting to use for a sense of security, the use of facial recognition software can be a massive invasion of privacy. And worse, it can also be discriminatory. Most facial recognition training tables are composed of images of white males. As a result, Facial recognition training produces systems that do well on white males, but they do not perform as well on women and people of color. So why is this discriminatory? It sounds the opposite. Minority terrorists are more likely to get past the facial recognition systems. But what about innocent minority citizens? They are more likely to be falsely recognized and detained a system that causes innocent minority citizens to be disproportionately de detained is simply unacceptable in the US. For this reason, companies like Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM have all decided to at least temporarily suspend 
sales of facial recognition software to law enforcement agencies. And there were bills pending in the legislatures to halt use of facial recognition until changes can be made to make the systems unbiased. Fortunately, the solution is difficult, but obvious. Facial recognition systems need to be trained on diverse tables of faces, not just faces of white males. And this issue isn't specific to facial recognition. It applies to AI systems that make other types of decisions, such as loan decisions, hiring decisions, and criminal sentencing decisions. The EU has enacted laws to require transparency of algorithms and data used in these automated decision systems, and the US is likely to follow shortly. And last but not least, military applications of AI are also frightening. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about the Terminator scenario. However, AI is used to make, is being used to make weapons of war even more deadly. Unmanned aerial vehicles without AI have been used in warfare since the US began to deploy them after the 9-11 attacks. These UAVs include drones, which are controlled remotely by operators at consoles, similar to a, a video game. Some UAVs only require a human to trigger the launch process after, they which, after which they are fully autonomous and use heat-seeking capabilities, radar, laser, or geographic coordinates to zero in on the target. No AI required. For example, the US military has relied on several systems that use radar to automatically target incoming missiles since 1977. AI is now being used to enhance the capabilities of these UAVs. With AI-based computer vision technology, the military can decide to launch an attack that relies on computer vision to automatically analyze the camera video and identify the target. Military per personnel can configure the UAV software so that once the vision system identifies the target, the attack can commence automatically. This is scary technology, but to put it in perspective, it's not scary at the level of nuclear weapons or chemical weapons that are capable of mass destruction. So to summarize today's talk, today's AI systems can do simple tasks very well, but will not become truly intelligent for a very long time, if ever. Lawmakers and pundits need to stop focusing on the fear of intelligent robots and start focusing on the real problems that are being caused by AI. Less fear of the Terminator, more fear of self-driving cars. Thank you for your time. And be sure to check out AIperspectives.com where you can dive deeper into this topic. All right, thanks so much, Steve. Um, you've raised a lot of very thought-provoking points about AI. Uh, we have a question from Roger. My concern is not with AI itself so much as it's being a powerful tool which is open to abuse by malevolent individuals. History has taught us these are all too common in the world. How can we control that danger? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, you know, AI is one more tool that, um, that the bad guys can use, you know, along with uh, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, um, uh, hacking, and, and, and so on. We, we've seen some AI technologies uh, that are, are particularly handy for the bad guys. One of them is deep fakes. Uh, using AI technology, you can now make a video of someone saying something that they never said. You know, imagine in a political campaign, someone puts on social media a video of a presidential candidate um, saying something really awful. Uh, that's difficult technology and it's, it's hard to know how to deal with it. Um, maybe we can make regulations with uh, serious penalties for deep fakes. 
Um, but but these are these are these are difficult issues. So you mentioned um, the necessity for governments to have some sort of legislation or regulation around AI. Uh, I'm sure you've thought about how that could best be approached, especially with the idea that you know people's algorithms are are patented, their IP, you know, we they don't want to be open source. They're they're in competition with each other. So, how do you think the the best way to approach regulation would be? Yeah, that's a great question, Cheryl. Um, so, for self driving cars, uh, most of them, most of the self driving cars are being tested with safety drivers behind the wheel, and the safety drivers keep their hands and feet off the wheel and only take over when they're afraid the car is going to get in an accident. And those are called, they call those disengagements. So I think what regulators should be doing is requiring car manufacturers to turn over the data on disengagements so that they can be analyzed and you know, essentially to determine, well, how many accidents or traffic jams would they would they have been caused if the safety drivers hadn't taken over? And we know how many you know how many accidents people get into. And we you know just at a simple level, we can compare the number of accidents that people get into to the number of accidents that would have been caused if the safety drivers hadn't hadn't taken over. And I think some some type of regulatory activity around those disengagements is is what we need. Yeah, so something similar to what the FDA does with the drug market. Exactly. Submitting your testing and proving that your, your product is safe. Exactly. And in fact, the NHTSA requires that for the non-self-driving capabilities. Mm -hmm. the manufacturers have to submit crash test data and, and other data to, produce, to prove their cars are safe in other ways. But they're, they're punting right now on self-driving capabilities because of the um, that, that, that false belief that, that the self-driving cars have to be safer than people. Yeah. So as you know leaders of technology companies in Connecticut, we're all very uh, cognizant of the need for cybersecurity and protecting our systems. How do you think AI will affect the world of cyber. So the idea of an intelligent virus that can think its way around the network is quite scary. Mm. Fortunately, it's complete fiction. We don't know how to make anything, computer anything that they can reason, much less viruses. Uh, but AI is being used by both the good guys and the bad guys in the cybersecurity area. The bad guys are using AI to sort through massive amounts of, of network data and find holes in, in computer networks where they can insert viruses. The good guys are using AI to understand what normal behavior means in a network and to detect abnormal behavior. Um, on, on balance, it, it seems like uh, AI is giving the good guys a little bit more of an advantage than the bad guys. And I think overall, um, AI will be a, a, a force of, of good in cybersecurity. Okay. And, you know, as an investor, you must have your finger on the pulse of the new initiatives out there, you know, the startups that are kind of pushing the horizons of AI. Where do you see AI headed, you know, in 2021 and in the next coming years? Sure. Um, so AI, AI, I see a lot of AI startups and AI companies can just roughly be broken down into platforms that help people build AI systems and AI applications that, that actually do something. A lot of the platform market is, is fully decided. The, the big players like Google and Amazon, and there are a lot of um, uh, private companies with 
uh, hundreds of million dollars in, re in revenue that have platforms that help companies build machine learning systems, AI systems. There are some platform areas around the edges that, that are helping people with um, uh, monitoring AI systems for performance and compliance and assurance. Um, but the platform markets, uh, the big ones are, are largely decided. On the AI application side, when investors look at AI applications, they should look at, a, at the company much the same way as they would look at a, a non-AI company, a, a non-AI software-based company and evaluate using all the standard metrics. Is there good product market fit? What's the revenue plan? What does the team look like? Um, and so on. And then look at the AI technology to see whether it really gives the company some kind of competitive advantage. Um, uh, but I, I've seen investors get dazzled by the number of PhDs mm. on a startup's staff and by all the fancy buzzwords that they use. And that's, that's the wrong way to go about evaluating uh, AI companies. So we have a, a question from David. Um, you stated that computers are limited in what they can process. So for instance, facial recognition or verbal response systems. Um, in the early 1980s, we generally understood computers to be tuned to process words, like as a word processor or data, data processors, but not both. Obviously technology has overcome these limitations and systems can handle both seamlessly. So his follow-up question is, don't you expect computers to handle multiple AI tasks in the future and become more intelligent and more towards that reasoning thinking machine that can evolve? So we only know how to build intelligence to do very narrowly defined tasks. What we, you know, one, one thought that some people have had is that, okay, so suppose we identify the million different little tasks that people can do, and we build a million little AI systems to do each of those tasks, then we wouldn't we have a, a, a big system that's intel as intelligent as a human. And the fallacy of that argument is that, well, you still need a thinking and reasoning system to know when to do which task. So the answer is no. That's not thinking and reasoning. The thinking and reasoning system is, is component is still needed. Yeah, it's funny. We were talking before the presentation about the book. I had recommended the Creativity Code. And he cites an example in there of um, an algorithm that would learn by mistakes and evolve. And what was really interesting was the, the scientists could not understand after a while the output of the algorithm and how that algorithm had evolved to produce that output. So, you know, that's an interesting conundrum. If you've got something that's self-learning and self-evolving, what kind of mechanisms do you have to monitor that evolution so that you can really understand, you know, what it's evolving to? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, so, and deep learning systems, especially neural networks tend to be black boxes. It's hard to tell what's going on inside. And uh, that interpret interpretability is, is a big issue. Um, if you have a, a deep learning network, a machine learning system that's making loan decisions or hiring decisions, um, and all you get as an answer is hire this person or give this loan or don't give this loan, um, and you don't really know, and you don't know what's going on, that's, that's a little bit scary because there could be bias inside, um, it, it could be making decisions for all the wrong reasons. And in fact, in the European Union, you can't do that anymore. If, you, if, a, if a, an automated system makes a decision that affects people, 
You have to be able to explain exactly how the machine made that decision. And I think we're moving in that direction in the US. And I think we should move in that direction in the US. Um, so the, the issue of what's going on inside the black box is, is a real one. Um, but uh, I don't think that should be confused with self-learning and self-reinforcement. Um, all these systems are doing is learning a function, uh -huh. learning the values of, of, of variables so that you can output that yes or no answer. They're not um, you know, becoming more intelligent inside the box to the point where eventually they're gonna wake up and gain consciousness. Uh -huh. So they're just using their experiences to increase the probability of success. Exactly, and, and in fact, um, deep learning systems have a lot of difficulty even incorporating new training examples. So uh -huh. um, I hesitate to even call that experience. Okay. So another uh, attendee said they just watched the Netflix documentary Coded Bias. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the question is, how do you fix this problem? You mentioned that the EU has already started to address this um, and that people have stopped using facial recognition for certain, um, you know, law enforcement activities. Who is addressing this right now and, and how is it being addressed? Yes, yeah, so there, there are a lot of companies that are looking at this. First of all, the solution in facial recognition and for, for a lot of these systems is simply unbiased data. Um, if you have a diverse data set, um, then you'll get a, uh, an unbiased machine learning system. So how do you get a diverse data set? Um, and how do you make sure that the training examples are diverse? There are a lot of companies out there now that are providing technology to analyze data sets um, to make sure that they're diverse and unbiased. And there are other companies that are actually providing monitoring capabilities so that even after you roll a machine learning system into production, they're monitoring that system to make sure it remains unbiased. Um, because as, as new data comes in at one end, that data might be biased. So you need to continually monitor it. And there are a lot of startups um, and academic institutions that are developing systems that do those things. So as a follow-up to that, you know, there are two parts to this problem because you've got the data. So you need to make sure that you've got a good sample data set to work off of. But then there's also the algorithm that is coded by human beings. <laughs> so how is, it how is it being addressed that the algorithm itself is not written in a biased fashion and using that data in a way that you know, could lead to a biased result. Yeah, so, so the algorithms, the way the algorithms are written, they cannot be biased. Only the data can be biased. Um, uh, so these, these algorithms go back 50, 60 years. And, and some of you might remember taking statistics in college where you learned linear regression. Um, uh, you know, for example, to, to take housing data like the number of rooms in a house and the number of bathrooms and predict the sale price of a house. Um, those are mathematical algorithms to just find the best weight for each of those variables um, on, on a mathematical basis. They can't possibly, that can't, a linear regression algorithm can't possibly be biased unless the data is biased. And as we've evolved over 50 or 60 years, the new algorithms that we use, deep learning algorithms, can tackle much larger data sets and compute much more complex functions, but they do so using very similar mathematics. And they're, 
You just can't be biased in those mathematics. Hmm. So do you see this evolving into new, you know, legal and ethical areas where uh, AI is being overseen by, you know, the attorney down the street or taught in, as an ethics course at yeah, the university level? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what's happening is, you know, well, first of all, in Europe, it's, it's, it's uh, a legal issue. You know, if a company, if a bank makes a loan decision with one of these systems and doesn't explain it well, um, they're in big trouble legally. Um, and I think that's going to happen in the U.S. also, and it should. Um, but beyond that, companies are being embarrassed. Um, uh, you know, for example, Amazon um, put out a hire, created a hire, machine learning hiring system to decide which software engineers to hire. And it turned out the system ended up being biased towards male engineers. Yeah. Why? because most of the software engineers they'd hired in the past were male. Um, uh, and of course, when they discovered it, they stopped using it right away. But it's, it's egg on the face for Amazon. Uh -huh. um, Google, when they first put out um, uh, uh, they're, they're, they have an, they have an, there's an object recognition system that you can use, uh, when, you, when it would be shown a picture of a, an African-American person that would say, oh, that's a gorilla. Big, big embarrassment for Google. Now, it, that's not because the people programmed it that way. It was just that, that the, the data didn't contain the right level of diversity. Um, so yeah, so there's gonna be a lot of legality and I think it's gonna be like, um, for corporations, it's gonna be like SOX compliance. You're going to need um, uh, bias compliance for your for your ML systems. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Well, that looks like all the questions we have today. So, I'd like to thank you, Steve, for a really thought provoking presentation and discussion here today. And uh, as the CEO of an early stage tech company, I'd like to personally thank you for supporting other technology entrepreneurs, um, as well as you know, being a thought leader in this area of artificial intelligence, because no matter what you work in, it's, it's affecting all of us. So thank you so much. Appreciate thank you, Cheryl. And, and thank you very much for moderating. That was a, that was a great job. Oh, good, thanks. Um, so uh, our next Tech Talk, will be on May 4th at 12 noon. Um, the registration is not open yet, but it should be by next week. So please check www.ct.org and join us on May 4th for the Cloud Journey and Ecosystem with Bill Franklin and Eric Saunders. Thanks everybody for attending and have a great day.